Hello, welcome to God's Big Picture, where we are tracing the story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, as we see how the one story of God's plan to save the world through Jesus unfolds. So far in these videos, we have covered the pattern of the kingdom from Genesis 1 and 2, the perished kingdom from Genesis 3, the promised kingdom from Genesis 17. Today, we'll think about the partial kingdom. So let's dive in and see more on the partial kingdom. In our last three videos, we have only covered one book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, which is a very important book in that it lays the foundation that is essential if we are to understand the rest of the Bible. We will now start moving at a much faster pace from now on with some of the books hardly getting a mention, if at all. The aim for us is not to get lost in details, but rather to see the sweep of the whole Bible story, that is, the big picture. In our previous video, we saw God's promise to Abraham, which summarized the three things, people, blood, and blessing. We will thus see in this video how God fulfills each of these three promises to Abraham in the story of the Old Testament. We will also see a fourth promise that is added, the promise of God's king. So first, the promise of God's people from Genesis 12 all the way to Exodus chapter 18. The promise of God to Abraham says in Genesis 12 verse 2, I will make you into a great nation. God does exactly that and we see that repeated again in Exodus 6 verse 7 where God says of Israel, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. The thing is, the promise of a nation does not happen smoothly. The first problem is that Abraham's wife Sarah is barren and they have no children. The gospel promises are in danger of fading almost as soon as they have been made. The years continue to pass and Sarah still doesn't conceive. But one day, God speaks to Abraham and reassures him that despite of her great age, she will bear a son. And sure enough, it happens. Isaac is born. Later on, we read that Abraham dies and the future of the promise now focuses on Isaac. Isaac marries Rebekah and they have two sons, Jacob and Esau. The family line continues where Jacob has 12 sons. They are far from being a great nation, but the promise is beginning to be fulfilled. One of Jacob's sons is Joseph, who, had, who adds up in Egypt as a slave. God is with him in Egypt and adds up in a very high office. A famine came, comes that threatens to wipe out Jacob and his family. They thus move to Egypt to be with Joseph and they settle there. By the beginning of the book of Exodus, we see that the family of Jacob have grown from 12 to 70 and then to many people. We read the following in Genesis chapter 1 verse 7. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land of Egypt was filled with them. We are thus told that their hosts enslaved them and mistreated them. And thus God must set them free if they are to be his people as he promised. And God does exactly that. He rescues them with mighty acts of judgment to Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. By his act of salvation, he set them free from the Egyptians and made them his own special people. In Exodus chapter 19 verse 4, God says this of Israelites, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. What we see then from the rest of the book of Exodus is that it focuses on the giving of the law and the establishment of the tabernacle. God is not just a God who delivers, he is also a God who demands and who draws people near to himself. He wants to bless his people. This thus takes us to the second promise that God gave to Abraham, the promise of God's blessing. Going back to Genesis chapter 12 verse 2, we read what God said to Abraham, I will bless you, God says. You see, you and I tend to have a negative attitude towards authority and assume that it must always be oppressive. But there is nothing negative about being under God's authority. In the Bible, to be under God's rule is to enjoy God's blessing. So, if the Israelites are to know God's blessing, they must be brought back under God's rule. Only then will they be able to enjoy a relationship with him and know his presence with them. The law is thus given by God on Mount Sinai. It's not intended to be the means by which anyone gets right with God. The Israelites are already God's people through his grace. 
God reminds them of that truth in the introduction to the Ten Commandments. Before he states any of his laws, he begins by saying in verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He redeems them before they receive the law. To put it differently, their obedience is not to be a desperate attempt to earn his salvation. It is a response to the salvation that he has already achieved for them. Now that God's people are under God's rule again, they are able once to come and enjoy God's presence. And the past purpose of this redemption is relationship with God. What we see next is that God instructs Moses on how to construct the tabernacle, the tent in which God's presence is to be focused among them as they travel toward the promised land. God's presence with his people is wonderful, but he also creates a problem. How can the Holy God live among a sinful people without destroying them? From the very start of the Israelites could not keep the law and they deserved to face God's judgment as a result. The sacrificial system is thus designed to deal with this problem. Sacrifices are, are offered in the tabernacle every day so that it can atone for the sin of the people. Once the law had been given and the tabernacle is established, the Israelites where God's people are under God's rule and enjoy God's presence come to be with his presence. But even with all this, there are a people without a lot. The next section of this history of the Bible is focused on the entrance of Israel to the promised land. And we are going to see this in the next video. For now, we are to be amazed at how God keeps his promise of making a sinful and wicked people his own people. We are to be amazed by how he dwells among them and how he allows them to come near to him. All this, as we'll see in the coming videos, points us to Jesus, the one and through whom you and I can come near God. We are to be glad that all God's promises have found their fulfillment in Jesus, and with us can trust him and believe in him today, tomorrow, and the days to come. So, let's take a pause there and come back to this story in the next video. Until next time, it's goodbye for now.